Don't hold anything too tightly. Just wish for it, want it, let it come from the intention of real truth for you, and then let it go. For me, our soul is like it's unbound, it's limitless, but we will use words to limit ourselves. When people stop believing that somebody's got your back or Superman's coming, we turn to ourselves, and that's where you become empowered. Courageous participation attracts positive things. I'm Gwyneth Paltrow. This is the Goop Podcast, bringing together thought leaders, culture changers, creatives, founders and CEOs, scientists, doctors, healers and seekers, here to start conversations because simply asking questions and listening has the power to change the way we see the world. Today is no exception. I'll let Elise fill you in on her extraordinary guest. All right, over to Elise. Hi, I'm Elise Lunan, co-host with Gwyneth of the Goo Podcast. In today's special episode, in efforts to spread awareness and helpful information on how we can best manage during the coronavirus pandemic, Sally Krawcheck will be joining us. Sally Krawcheck is the CEO and co-founder of Elvest. She has also been referred to as the most powerful woman on Wall Street. Her mission has always been helping women realize their financial power and to get women everywhere on a path to financial freedom. Today, Sally offers her wisdom from a financial perspective about what the world might look like after this pandemic and how we can manage through it. We'll talk about investing, how we can manage our finances when we feel like we don't have much coming in, and the impact the coronavirus might have on the stock market in the long term. Hopefully, after our conversation, you'll feel some relief about this unprecedented time. Let's get right to my chat with Sally Krawcheck. Sally, I'm sure you are wildly busy right now, and I'm really grateful to talk to you because I feel like you are unusual in the sense that you probably have um, an unprecedented bird's eye view on both personal finance and what's happening in the markets at large, having participated in Wall Street for so long. So have you, I mean, Mm -hmm. I know everyone's saying unprecedented and extraordinary, and obviously Mm -hmm. it is, but have you seen anything quite like this? You know, Elise, thank you for having me. And I'm I'm really very, very happy to be here, sort of not the circumstances, but to to be with you. Um, You know, it's, it's the different from every other downturn, and it's the same as every other downturn. It's different in that, my goodness, did it happen fast. It was, everything was fine until the moment it wasn't. And we went from what we call a bull market, a really robust, strong mar- you know, stock market to what's called a bear market, which is down more than 20% and record, you know, close to record down days. Um, and it was happening at the same time that, you know, we were fearful about our own health. We're fearful about others' health. We're fearful about the response or la- lack of enough of a response coming out of, um, you know, the different capitals in the world. And so it was different in that, you know, the, la- the last crisis was caused because banks, you know, lent to- too much money to people they shouldn't have been lending to. And, you know, and that caused it. This was caused by some, you know, by a health issue. So it was different in that way. It's same as other downturns in another way, which is the, you know, the volatility in the stock market and the buying, you know, in the markets out there, the investment markets out there um, is really a means of investors having what I think of as a conversation with our policymakers. And that the markets are telling the stock market and the bond market are saying, hey, we're going into a sharp recession. That's why we're declining so quickly. And then the policymakers, maybe it's the Federal Reserve that controls interest rates, is responding by taking down interest rates to zero. And now in some cases, you know, interest rates are below zero, which is almost sort of unimaginable in some ways. And then the, the markets will say for a day, that's terrific. And the markets will be like, ah, you know what? Not enough. And so then the policymakers will pass what's called a fiscal stimulus of this sending money, you know, checks to individuals, lengthening unemployment benefits and expanding them out. And, the, and so on a day by day basis, 
the markets and the policymakers are having a conversation. Now, the, the unfortunate part is that, you know, it affects our pocketbooks if we are investors for some, you know, what I hope for is a short period of time. But it's, you know, it's it's the same as others and it's different from others, as probably is the case with every single financial downturn that we have. All right, Sally, I know you're not psychic, but I feel like you're financially very intuitive. So what do you see happening? Do you think that we'll go into, it seems like obviously we're heading for a recession. Do you think it's a depression or do you think that we could theoretically mm-hmm. bounce back quickly? I don't know the answer to that. I can tell you what I do know. What I do know, Elise, is that we have recovered from every single recession in our history and every single depression in our history. And the market has recovered from every, the stock market has recovered from every single downturn. Um, And so these things are scary while they happen, but our country, so many countries of the world are innovative. People start businesses, people build businesses, people think of new businesses that weren't even a thing X number of years ago. Um, And with the government aware of the significant damage to the economy and making capital and loans and money available, maybe not enough in the first instance, maybe not enough in the second instance, but over time, what I know is that we have always recovered. Um, And so I feel confident that we're going to recover again and that people will look at this time, you know, if they're investors and say, dang it, I wish I'd, man, if I'd only bought a whole bunch of stock, you know, in March of 2020. Could you imagine? I know, I just know in my bones that will be the case. Right. So for people who are, I want to talk about people who are struggling in a minute. Um, For people who have access to money and feel like they're relatively secure either in their employment or that they have plenty in a in the savings account for easy access, is this a time to buy? And what do you, what's your recommendation yes. there? Yes, it, it is a time to buy. And I believe tomorrow will be a time to buy and two weeks from now and a month from now and, you know, six years from now. I, I truly believe that. Not any individual stock. I don't have a crystal ball, but investing in a broad-based set of stocks and bonds. At Elevest, we do it through what are called exchange-traded funds, ETFs. And we really think the right way to invest is a bit out of every paycheck. And you know, while we think of the stock market as going up and down and up and down and up and down, actually what it has done historically is it goes up and then down a bit and then up more and then down a bit and then up more. And so it's, there's volatility around an upward trend. And what really matters here is, you know, not, as they say, timing the market. Is this exact day a good day? Is this stock a good stock? But time in the market. And let me give you an example of how incredibly powerful this has been historically in the stock market. If you put money in, if you're able to leave it, and if that money can then earn money on that money, the returns if you've earned, and then you earn returns again, and it earns returns on the original money and the returns and the returns. It's called compounding. If you had invested $1,000 in 1900 um, and left the money there, and if I had told you, Elise, you know, there are a bunch of bad things that are going to happen between 1900 and 2019, 2020. There's going to be a flu pandemic in 1917. There's going to be two world wars. We're going to have a terrorist attack on U.S. soil. We're going to have wars in Vietnam, in Korea, in the Middle East. We're going to have inflation. We're going to have stagflation. We're going to have the Great Depression. We're going to have the Great Recession. We're going to have the internet bubble burst. Like all this bad stuff. You know, we're going to elect a reality star for president. In the 80s, we're going to elect a movie star for president. How much do you think that $1,000 is worth? Because that's a bunch of bad stuff, right? Do you know the answer to this, Elise? No. $57 million. Wow. You invested $1,000 back then and were able to leave it in with all the ups and all the downs, that power of the compounding of earning money on money would leave you with $57 million. Now, 
One of the reasons you and I have talked about this before, women have less wealth than men. We always talk about the gender pay gap, 82 cents on the dollar. Ah, I'm frustrated. Ah, darn it. You know, the gender wealth gap, at least, is 32 cents on a man's dollar. And no. some big of that, I know, and going in the wrong direction. The gender pay gap, at least, is moving slightly in a positive direction. The gender wealth gap is going in the wrong direction. And part of that reason is that men have invested more than we women have, and wealth compounds. Wealth compounds. Even with tough markets like this, even with them being sprinkled in, wealth begets wealth. And so for anybody who's got the, you know, and, and I totally get it, but your financial situation needs to be secure. You're, you need to be able to invest for the long term, 10, 15 years. But the, I, it is a good time to invest, in my opinion, if you can take that, that long-term perspective. Yeah. And so, um, and, and theoretically women, you know, we've talked about this as before as well. Women tend to be better investors, right? Because they tend to take the long game and to not try and day trade or game the market right. or get the timing perfect. And we don't look as much, you know, we're so busy, right? We got the kids and we got the, in normal times, the carpools and we've got, the job where we have to be better to get to, you know, the same level of advancement. We have all that stuff. And for whatever reason, I, I do think there may be a testosterone estrogen thing going on here, but for whatever reason we leave it. And so we outperform men when we invest because we tend to just freak out less. Yeah. And maybe it's that, maybe it's because we're so attuned to our bodies and our bodies change so much, like on, mm -hmm. on the regular every month to some extent, mm -hmm. that we're just used to flow and men are not, <laughs> like men are more stagnant, you know? Well, yeah, um, there, there is something. It may be that men also were historically sort of the hunters and we were the gatherers. And so, you know, they go out and try to have that conquest, right? I mean, how many cocktail parties have you been to where some dude is talking about the stock he bought or um, Bitcoin. I mean, what, you know, what woman have you ever heard? Oh, I traded Bitcoin. Like it doesn't happen. <laughs> um, so is your, is your advice, I have an Alvest account, by the way, um, Good. to not look right now besides potentially trying to put more money into it to take advantage of what's happening is, is, is it better to just avert your eyes if you feel like your strategy is sound and, and quite diversified? Oh, it's going to be down since the, um, you know, we're, we're sitting here several weeks into a bull market. If you look today, um, it's going to be down. I'll tell you, at least I haven't looked since it began. Why, why would I do that to myself? There's nothing I can, you know, I, at this moment in my life, and I'm sure you're the same, I am all about control what you can control, you know, right. just stay in what I have control over because I feel like I've lost control in so many areas right now. Um, yeah. so it's, 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 and looking is not, I can't make it go up. I, you know, if I turn on CNBC, I can't make the stock market go up. Um, the, uh, you know, the adjustment I would make, you and I have talked about this in the past at, at Elevest, you know, our recommendation is, you know, if you, if you're able to 50% of your take home pay goes to needs, um, 20, 30% to fun, 20% to future you taking care of older you, and that can be paying off your credit card debt. It could be building an emergency fund for times like this, and it it's investing. And, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it could be the thing is that right now, you know, it's, it's not a lot of fun being had that costs money, costs money. I mean, I'm waiting for this baby boom after this thing. I mean, it's going to be a, a just <laughs> epic. 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 Oh and divorces. Start, start a business for babies. Um, but you know, that doesn't really cost you anything yet. And so maybe in this time, that 30% for fun, you put in for future you, you say, okay, fine, I can't go out to a restaurant, I can't whatever, you know, let me go ahead and start investing this um, with, with an LFS, we hope, but or with someone else in a diversified investment portfolio to get a head start on on helping out grandma you. So in, in the context of people who are um, maybe are, are part of the 3 million who applied for unemployment this week, um, who might be way in the waves of unemployment that are surely coming. What's, what, how do you 
how does that change um, when you yeah. have very little coming in? Clearly, you want to avoid pulling on your 401k if at all mm. possible. But what what's your – and you don't want to sell. Like, you know, it's – No, I know. It's, it's tough. And, and this is why we recommend at, at LFS that you have an emergency fund that, you know, of that, you know, 20% that's going to future you, that you, you know, build up three months of take-home pay, if you can, six months of take-home pay um, for exactly times like this, which is I lost my job. I'm, you know, I've, I've got maybe an unemployment check coming in. It may not be enough. I can dip into that emergency fund. You know, what I say for folks right now who are facing this is keep an eye for what's coming out of D.C., you know, whether it's the checks that are being sent uh, to people, whether it's student, you know, the government is waiving two months of payments and interest on student loans, um, whether it's, you know, more unemployment benefits specifically for people who didn't get them in the past. But even to your point, you really don't want to pull money out of your 401k if you if you need to happily um you know they're they're talking in dc about a provision that allows people to withdraw up to a hundred thousand dollars out without paying the penalty and and giving Mm. them more time to pay it back so keep an eye on what's what's coming there um and of course you know look for you know there are people who are hiring it may not be your dream job to you know, work at, at Amazon or one of the, the big, big tech companies that are hiring, but, you know, there, and, but there will be businesses also that come out of this that will spring up that will, will be hiring. Yeah. And, um, I'm curious to see, obviously they just passed the $2 trillion package, mm-hmm. but it seems like particularly in Europe, a, the approach that they're taking is guaranteed is the government is stepping in to keep people employed, right? Mm-hmm. Like by paying a significant, portion uh, for yeah. businesses, I don't know the specifics, but it looks like for businesses who have taken a certain percentage cut in terms of revenue, they're stepping well, in the, to... The, this is, the uh, you know, to, in my opinion, the right thing to do. Because yeah. if the policymakers want to keep the economy going, yes, you know, a check being sent to people is, is, is certainly a way to do it. But having the job, Elise, you know, having something, you know, to, to be gainfully employed, whether you're working from home, um, you know, if you're you're one of our heroes who are going out and, and working in the community with those essential jobs, it just leads to a purpose in life. And so we also have been watching carefully for, um, and as, you know, someone who's running a business um, where, you know, our businesses, uh, you know, knock on wood, because we have been long-term investments because we're all things money for women. We, we've been in very good shape, but you know, I don't think anybody's taking their revenue forecast way up these days. So we're keeping right. an eye as well as we, we look to you know, protect jobs at our company. Yeah, no, I think it's happening uh, obviously all over the country and, and businesses, small businesses in particular, but big businesses as well are in a really, really awkward bind, particularly because there's so much uncertainty about how long this will last, how quickly mm. people will, you know, want to spend money or um, go back to quote unquote normal. So um, and then I think the bigger, bigger existential questions around our economy and mm-hmm. where we're where we're heading and um, and, well, and, and whether we can. Add, yeah. And I, I would add to that, you know, also is you and I both leaders of businesses you know, what I was telling, I was telling my team this week, it's it's very easy to have your company values on the wall. um, And they're pretty easy to live by during a good environment. But how do you treat people and your team and your, your users and your community and your customers during a tough environment? And I've obviously spent a lot of my career, as you know, I, I ran Merrill Lynch for a period of time. I ran Smith Barney when there was a Smith Barney. I was chief financial officer of City. So I worked at places that would do whole scale layoffs and they never did them lightly. Um, but I would note that it, it changes a company and it changes a culture um, that for those who are still there, it's, it's, you know, it's tough. And it's of course tougher for the people who leave. And when you get to the other side, 
hiring people back is not as seamless and easy. And so, but yet, you know, as, as a business leader, you, you may come to the circumstances where you have to do that um, to, to put the company in, in good shape. Um, these are, these are ter- terribly tough decisions. And of course, tougher on the people who, you know, are on the receiving end. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's also, um, I think probably what's happening for people who both have jobs currently or fearing losing their jobs or who have lost their jobs, there's an existential crisis that invariably happens. It's sort of like what happens when you go on vacation, right? And you're, mm-hmm. you're distanced from your normal routine, you start to reevaluate all of the choices that you've made and mm-hmm. how you're spending your time. So I also feel like we're going to see a really interesting um, evolution there where people are going to mm-hmm. say like, no, no, I'm not doing that anymore. Um, mm-hmm. Just completely I hear changing. Mm-hmm. I'm sort of <clears throat> waiting for that moment here. You know, I'm usually in New York City. I'm not in New York City right now. And I'm sort of waiting for the, am I going to have the breakthrough of, I love the sunlight and the air and the space. And, and right now, at least I got to tell you, I am, um, I'm not there. I'm at the, I wish I had gone to more parties. I wish I had gone <laughs> more dinners. I wish I had visited you in LA more and taken more red eyes back to New York. Um, I, you know, invite me to do anything, please on the other side of this, because I will do everything. <laughs> Oh, I know. I know. It's, it's I, just, true, I haven't had I, that breakthrough. I honest to gosh, haven't had that breakthrough yet of, oh, my former life. Well, you know, oh, no, I need to change. I'm like, no, I just want my life back badly. Yeah. No, I hear you. I'm having sort of a, um, because I'm, you know, chained to my desk and mm. like you and my computer and Zoom calls and high five calls and team hangouts and phones. I'm like, get this technology away from me. I mean, I'm, I can't, yeah. I'll be curious if I can maintain that um, mm. in, in the post COVID world, but I do feel like we're having, it's like a collective, it's, it's so strange on so many mm. levels, but it is sort of that collective um, break and um, just forced reevaluation of what we're, what we're doing with our time here. Well, now, you know, I will tell you the one thing I'm doing differently is I am because there is so much stress. I'm taking a 30 minute nap every afternoon, which of course I would never do in the office. And I am trying to give myself these little breaks because it, it is so much and it feels so weird and the stakes are, can feel high right now, yeah. you know, uh, decisions that you make that, you know, really affect people. Yeah. I also feel like um, maybe this is a perverse or weird thing to say, but, you know, we've had this conversation as well. Like, I'm not alone as a woman and in sort of having historically shied away from it or had sort of my various judgments about it, right? Like, it feels Mm -hmm. gross to want, you know, it it has a lot of emotional baggage, I think, for women in particular. And um, you see that in the Mm -hmm. ways that many of us choose our careers, right? Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. but now, weirdly, I'm having sort of this, like, not, it's not dark, but this, like, oh, I need, like, what do I need to do to secure financial freedom and security? Mm -hmm. What is my number? Maybe I need to be a little bit more clear with myself about what it is and not have shame Mm -hmm. about it. Because I also Mm -hmm. don't think it would be inherently that shameful or, you know what I mean? I am always having these conversations where I'm like, is it, are my wants and needs, are they, am I asking for too much? You know, like, I know. Because you've been socialized that way. I I don't know if, you know, you you and I have discussed this over, you know, liquid, um, whether it's (laughs) coffee or wine, we won't, we won't share. Um, But we've just been socialized as women that we're, not good with money, that asking for more money is, is still unladylike. And, and, you know, not every person who's listening to this, but, you know, is, is a rule that we think of math as being boys are better at math than girls. It's not true. Boy, men are better investors than women. That's not true. Um, so I think of money still today, you know, it, it wasn't 
so long ago that um, women weren't supposed to be athletic. And, and today, women really aren't supposed to be good with money. And we've, we've built up some shame around it, both, you know, having it, asking for it, going for it. Um, and, and I love to say if the guys had gotten together 200 years ago and they said, how can we keep women from having full equality and power? This is what they would have done. And, you know, because we thought, oh, money is for men and investing is for men and trading is for men and all that stuff, we, we would have stayed away from Wall Street. We would have stayed away from venture capital. And, you know, we wouldn't have asked for the raises because we wouldn't have known what to ask for. And, and maybe, you know, I, I'm hopeful maybe at least this is a moment where, you know, maybe some of us get a little more pissed off than, than we've been. Because for so many, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in the household. We're losing jobs at a greater rate than the men are. Most of the, you know, so much of the child care still falls on us. So much of the meal prep still falls on us. And, you know, this might be a point, you know, just as perhaps with the moment of, huh, you know, paid sick leave, it's not greedy, those greedy people right. being sick, you know, it's actually a public health issue. It, it affects all of us. Then maybe we also, at this point, say, you know what, I, I'm not going to play that game anymore. I'm going to be unladylike and, and ask for that, that money. I'm going to, you know, or lose that job where, you know, they, they aren't treating me fairly. Right. And I think that it's also a time for, for, and I know people have been mobilizing around this for decades, but people need a safety net. It is completely mm-hmm. insane that we are living in a society where people are literally hanging on by a fingernail yeah. to know to know and it's not their fault you know yeah. it's it's sort of the seeding of that idea of like the the welfare queen of the 80s or this idea that um and that was apparently a real person but like i think mm-hmm. what is it welfare frauds like half a percentage point something oh, yeah. it's, come on oh I, you that know. doesn't uh, well, exist you can find yeah. an example of bad you know bad folks everywhere um right no but, i yeah i'm I'm in agreement with you. You know, we, we, we spend so much money on our elderly whom we all love. Um, but it's our children who are our future. It's their education. That's our future. Mm -hmm. Um, and if they don't get off to a good start because through no fault of their own, their, their parents don't have the the means, you know, that puts our society at, at risk. Right. And when you have people who can't use their gifts because they, are making minimum wage and living well beneath the poverty line. Like, how is that moving society forward? You know, mm-hmm. not to, it's complicated, et cetera, and I'm oversimplifying everything, but it just feels like le- this feels like a, enough of a communal crisis for everyone. It's it doesn't matter how much money you have or whether you're famous or not. This, this pandemic is touching everyone mm-hmm. and will continue to touch everyone and sort of expose all of these you know, cracks that are being held together by duct tape, you know, it's, it's, we were not going to be able to build a stable future. At least we are the richest country, the most powerful country in the history of the world. We spend so many multiples of the, the national budget on instruments of war than we do on the CDC. Yeah. Um, You know, we don't have a mandated paid parental leave. We're the only country, developed country that doesn't have it. We, you know, we, we don't have that safety net for so many people. Um, and, and by the way, our educational system, the public educational system is not preparing people for the jobs of today, certainly not tomorrow. So we're not even preparing them. And then we don't give them any help when they haven't been prepared. How do, you know, how do we get to be so mean? I how know. do we get to be so mean? Like, it's you know, great. oh, those, you know, just I said no paid sick leave, oh, those greedy sick people, but same, those greedy mothers, you know, having their babies and ah, wanting to have time to heal, jerks. I mean, come on, seriously? <laughs> seriously. I know. I know, but it's, it's a perpetu, we just perpetuate it on each other because mm-hmm. it's sort of that hazing cycle, you know, of, well, I didn't get paid leave, so why should you? And mm-hmm. until we can have, you know, choose love and kindness, you know, it's like Marianne Williamson. Um, mm-hmm. I loved her campaign in so many ways because 
like a department of peace or a department of children. Mm -hmm. Why is that such a crazy idea? You know, there is no one. Yeah. At some point we, and, and I'm also hopeful it will come out of this. We need to recognize that giving something to someone else does not have to take away from you. I mean, at some point, you know, Roosevelt, you know, through the great depression decided to have social security. Okay. You know, but what we don't, you know, I guess back then people were like, well, I saved for my retirement. And so you should have to, too. Like at some point you have to say too bad, right? Right. Too bad. So sometimes life doesn't come out to be fair. Maybe you didn't take on student loan debt, but for us to lift this crushing burden from our young people, you know, doesn't, don't be jealous. Like go on, move yeah. on. The fact that you didn't Absolutely. have paid parental leave doesn't doesn't mean someone else shouldn't have it. If we were doing something wrong, why why keep doing it? And in that example that you used at the beginning about what happens to a thousand dollars over the span of hundred and twenty years, we're we're living in an expanding universe. We're living in an expanding economy, and um, and yet it's not. Um, it's not reaching everyone. And so, and, and now we see that, we see the implications of that at scale. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, I think the more we can incur, and maybe this will light the fire if it hadn't already been lit under, it, it certainly is just emboldening people like me where I'm like, I need to, I can't be, sh you know, shy or dainty or ashamed again of like mm -hmm. ensuring that, doesn't, I don't need, like, again, here I am equivocating and explaining uh -huh. myself, like, yeah. you know, it's, it's funny, but I think for, uh, for, for many women, it's, it's going to require sort of a process of healing around, like, what do I deserve and do I deserve this? And, um, and again, it goes to that idea. I think for whatever reason, we've talked about this before, that women see, money and financing as a pond and men see it as a river. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We have this idea that if I get more, invariably someone gets less. It's like the pain scale of suffering, which is so useless in times like this um, and not true, right? I think no. that's not no. true. Well, and, and sometimes you have to tell yourself as a woman, look, if, if I get this money, it positively affects my children. Hey, it mm -hmm. positive, you know, there's always some smarty, smart ass, if I may. Whenever I say, tell me any, something bad that happens, women have, women have more money, they spend more. Always somebody says it. You're like, oh, okay, fine. But guess what? That's actually a good thing. That's yeah. growing the economy. That is, you know, movement and energy and positivity. Um, that is a good thing. And so it's good for us. It's good for our partners. It's, it's good you know, it's certainly good for society because of the evening out of the, of the, um, you know, the relative power in relationships, um, you know, all kinds of different relationships. So yeah. all of these things are good, but look, we've, we've grown up, we've been, we've grown up with a scarcity mentality. That's the pond. There isn't enough money. There's not more money coming in. Um, you know, and it's a scarcity mentality, in the workplace, there's only room for one senior woman at the table. And that's, of course, one of the reasons I love Goop. And one of the reasons I love Elevest so much. Nope, room for all of us. Let's go. You know, mm -hmm. we, we can, Elevest can grow to the sky. You know, let's go. Yeah. I was talking to a friend um, and she pointed out to me that the word economy comes from the Greek word for home. And I was like, that is so amazing and beautiful and so resonant at this time that we're all trapped in our homes mm -hmm. thinking about you know the stuff that we do buy and finding that mm -hmm. this is more of a spiritual question for you but like I was sort of remarking on Instagram about just you know being surrounded by all of my stuff and mm -hmm. how we've been we we've been in the last really kind of 20 years this wasn't it wasn't the way it was when I was a child where I feel like there was one place, I mean, I grew up in a small town, but like one place to go and buy clothes, there wasn't mm -hmm. this concept of fast fashion and you bought high quality things and they lasted and then you donated, they went to, you know, mm -hmm. Salvation Army or Goodwill and had another life. And now we're way past that in terms mm -hmm. of our consumption and our consumption of 
crappy things. It's like the the good, fast, cheap, pick two. Um, we're picking fast and cheap. So what do you think if we all sort of as we're being suffocated by our things at home um, and sort of forced to face what we've consumed, what do you think, how do you think that will affect the economy if, if, if many of us go back and are like, let, let me either consume fewer things or just consume fewer, better things? Well, look, what, what I, let's start with what it can do for individuals because the economy is a collection of the actions of many, 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 many individuals and, and companies as well. Um, and, you know, at least I am so surprised almost every week by some outwardly very successful, gosh, she's getting it done, woman who will come to Elevest, meet with one of our financial planners, and will find out she has all kinds of credit card debt. All kinds mm. of credit card debt. You're like, just gosh, I would, I wouldn't have guessed you've got ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand, fifty thousand. What? And and this amount bleeds away at her future. You know, credit card debt cost, you know, can be an interest rate of eighteen percent or twenty two percent. It can really, you know, drain away one's wealth. Uh, we often, by the way, find people make this mental mistake that they've got credit card debt and savings. Now, by the way, if any of our listeners have that, pay off your credit card debt with your savings because you're earning about nothing on the savings. And, you know, on the credit card debt, you're paying a lot. Your listeners may say, but Sally, you know, well, you told me to have an emergency fund. I know, but, you know, this is bleeding away at your wealth. And you can always, if you don't have an emergency fund and you have an emergency, you can run up your credit card debt. Anyway, that's an aside. But um, it's the, the reason for this credit card debt in so many cases, Elise, is, is keeping up with Susie. And Susie's right. got this back and so-and-so's got this other thing, you know, uh, this other outfit at work and the sense of, but I, you know, and I think I also came into adulthood with a sense of you, you buy clothes in the fall. That's what you do, you know, back to school, like, <laughs> buy clothes. And, you know, so I kept buying them. I'm like, wait, you know, I, I, I don't want all of this. And so on the one hand, right, you know, there could be less activity in the economy. On the other hand, you know, I'm buying all my stuff from my friend, Julie Wainwright's The Real Real, the online consignment shop, because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, the, the long-term economy will be helped by less production of fashion. It's one of the drivers of, you know, deterioration in the environment. Um, mm -hmm. And the long-term economy will be helped by me having more savings and investments so that I can support myself in my older, you know, in my older age as opposed to, you know, having some kind of cataclysmic, you know, retirement shortfall. So, you know, I, look, I mean, we, we all, you don't want everybody to never spend again. Um, but, you know, looking towards what we call it Elevest intentional spending. And this is really a time to think about it. What is important to me? What is yeah. important to me? Having the next pair of shoes? Or is it coming out to LA to see you after this is over and, you know, having a glass of wine and seeing my other friends and going to a party. For me, it's that. It's, it's the latter. Yeah. So in terms of intentional spending, how do you, what does that process look like as people start to evaluate what's, what's adding value to their lives? Yeah. You know, we talk to people, we're actually bringing out a little money course on this, but we talk to people about really sitting back and, you know, what are your highest values as a person or as a family? Um, maybe that highest value is family. Maybe that highest value is, is career achievement. You know, maybe that highest value is kindness to others around you. You know, what, what are those values? And then start to take a look and say, does my spending align with my values? You know, if mm -hmm. one of my highest values is time with my family, and travel and expanding my, you know, horizons. Why am I buying, you know, the new pair of boots every, you know, every season? What was, mm -hmm. does that align? Is that, you know, it's a little bit of the Marie Kondo does a spark joy. Does my spending align with my best self, with what I, what is important to me and cut out the things that don't cut out the stuff 
you know, do you, do you really need Hulu and Netflix and Apple and Disney and whatever, right? Is that your value? You know, sitting on a, you know, it's something great about sitting on a sofa and being in receive mode, but, you know, do you, is that really making you happy or are there other things you can be doing with that money that will be more meaningful to you? Yeah. The money and the time, right? Because I feel like those those are our scarce resources, money, time, attention, or just energy in general, um, like the linear time and then also just how we spend how we spend our focus. Um, and you can't get time back. How old are your kids, yeah. Ali? Six and three. Yeah. You know, one of one of my great, you know, blessings right now is my kids are older because I can't even imagine <laughs> at six and three <laughs> being with them. Um, I can't even believe it. My my daughter's boyfriend is with us. If you had told me I would be living with my daughter's boyfriend, I wouldn't have. <laughs> I would be like, what? We're doing a multi-generational thing. But um, but on the other hand, I'd give anything to see them again at, at six and three. You can't, you just can't get that back. Um, sure, you'll look back on this time later in your life and think about what, you know, what a special time it was in some ways. No, for sure. I think as bizarre and difficult and terrifying as this time is it's mm. also really beautiful and has mm. been beautiful and i think exactly you know with once once there's certainty that that we're safe and we've recovered then i think the rose colored glasses come on to make it even <laughs> yeah. even more special i will not miss being my child's math teacher oh my gosh I'm not gonna <laughs> oh my god no no um yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. It's been interesting to see what, you know, what his schoolwork is. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but no, I like that. I think it's so, you know, it's, we talk about this a lot at Goop because, you know, we make products and it drives people crazy that they're, that they're as expensive as they are. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that we try to use really beautiful mm -hmm. ingredients and we make them at, you know, lovely family owned mm. factories and particularly, you know, I'm talking about the clothing specifically, it's made by, you know, trained artisans and adults and it's really beautiful fabric and then it's, it's timeless. So theoretically you'd wear it for many, many yeah. years. I can mm -hmm. attest to that. So, but it's not designed so that you feel like you need to compulsively buy, mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, having been that person earlier in my life, like in my 20s when I was working at fashion magazines of just like, I cannot fathom the amount of stuff I acquired, the mm. amount of shoes I owned. Um, and then, and I did it with this idea, this false idea that it would find a second life. Mm. And... You know, we know we're glutting landfills and, you know, that, that certainly it's not finding a second life. And um, I hope it's a retraining. I hope it for all of us, for myself included, that I am just continuing to like grind down into, um, you know, even now it's like I got an email from Bowdoin and I really like their kid stuff. And I was like, oh, I should take advantage of this. And I should, and mm -hmm. I'm like, do I really like, do my kids actually need more clothing? Like, I think they're okay. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a retraining, you know? I know. I know. Well, look, and, and one thing I would add, so, you know, you've got it from your perspective, by the way, I love my goop dry brush. I just brush it on oh, my skin. Yeah, girl. <laughs> hurts a little bit, but hurts so good. And my heart's you know, so you good. Feel the, yeah, um, I, I just love it. I just, I thought I lost it. I couldn't find it. Um, and it was really, there was a sort of two day tear up the house. Obviously it was in the drawer in my bathroom, exactly where it should have been. Um, but anyway, but, you know, so that's your, the perspective from Goop. I'll tell you over at Elevest, you know, where we, we're seeing some change is we can talk about how women don't have as much money as men and we need to invest more and blah, blah, blah. The other thing I'll say you know, we talked about intentional spending and being thoughtful um, and, you know, very intentional about where the money is going, but also where it is being invested. Um, mm -hmm. you know, yes, you absolutely want to earn a return on that money. Um, 
but do you want it invested in gun manufacturers, even if the return is going to be good? And, you know, there was a point to it. It's called impact investing or values-based yep. investing. Um, and at Elevest, it's something any number of our, you know, community and, and, and clients ask for and do. And, you know, what's fascinating is the research tells us that by investing in your values, gosh, I want to invest in companies that are run by women where there are more women on the board. I want to invest in companies that are looking to improve the environment, not destroy the environment. I want to invest in companies that take um, online privacy seriously because, you know, that actually, when when that goes awry, it is worse for women and it can be catastrophic for people in other countries in the LGBTQIA community. It can be a life and death issue. And, and if you invest in those companies, the, the historical um, industry dogma is that you have to give up returns. Um, and mm. we're finding the research is telling us that you can invest your money in companies you feel proud of. It doesn't mean they won't make a mistake. You know, in investment portfolios that you say, yep, my money is, is backing up what I care about without giving up the return. So that, you know, they're, you know, sort of watching for those different places that check the boxes. Am I as a whole person, you know, doing as much good, living as an intentionally as I, I can be. Mm -hmm. No, I think, I think it matters. I think we're, we're um, seeing that like everything that you bring into your life or your house or your body, like it matters. And mm -hmm. we have to be more responsible about understanding the full life cycle of our decisions mm -hmm. and the downstream implications of them. Um, and it, we can't, we can't really look away anymore. I think that's been one of the, um, like I was talking to, I was listening to this, um, sort of spiritual teacher and she was saying that, toilet paper, the shortage on to of toilet paper mm -hmm. in this pandemic is a great divine joke because mm -hmm. what we're being called to do is to look at our shit, really. Mm -hmm. And, you know, instead of just consuming and averting our eyes, we're being called to understand and think about all the impact of all of our actions. And mm -hmm. exactly, it's like, I don't, I can't write, I can't, you know, join fight like a mother and go and petition my senators for common sense gun laws and then be part of a portfolio that supports mm -hmm. gun manufacturers. And I think it feels overwhelming and like so much work, but I am grateful to oh, companies like yours or Goop for trying to do the right thing for people so that you don't have to worry so much about the well, downstream. Exactly right. So, so, you know, there's a real commonality between Goop and Elevest that I, you know, sort of struck me since the last time we spoke, which is, you know, with Goop and your um, attention to wellness, you know, why is that resonating with women so much? Well, it's because the existing patriarchal medical community infrastructure approach, you know, sometimes has, has really left us behind, you know, whether it's that, you know, we, we don't treat people until they get sick, that the mm -hmm. testing is done on men, not women. I mean, you could go on for a lot longer than I could. Um, and the goop, you know, with its approach to wellness is sort of a really feminine approach to health, a different approach to health, one that drives people, some people crazy. Um, the fact that <laughs> there's a different approach, um, you know, means that they want to write, you know, c condescending articles, et cetera. Well, Elevest, was built as investing firm, um, built by women, built for women um, and women plus, and people who really felt like, feel like the existing investing um, industry is not for them, whether it's because when they look to it, you know, it is, you know, they don't see themselves reflected back. It's because they don't think, you know, trading where we started, should I be trading today? Should I be watching CNBC has not felt right to them. In fact, the money industry 
you know, CNBC is just ESPN for money. The investing industry, you know, has made money into a sport. And not that, Mm -hmm. you know, you and I love sports, but it's not what we want to do with our money. And so, you know, Elevest was really built, you know, with also the impact investing as a different way. And and I believe you me, you know, we we don't have the profile Goop does to, you know, in the in the national press, but um, in the industry, it they are they you definitely get the same hope. You know, gosh, let me say how silly what they're doing is. Oh, impact investing, what <laughs> ridiculous! Um, but we really are trying to, as you are, appeal to people for whom the existing you know construct just has not worked well. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I think it's it's. Right now, I think we're seeing how ready people are to do things a little differently. And I think it'll be really interesting just in the context of health and wellness, whether this pandemic switches uh, switches our entire world or, or uh, you know, I'm sure in the U.S., actually, I'm not sure of anything under this current government, but that we um, start focusing on upstream health and we start thinking about preventative medicine and um, keeping people well, keeping people mm-hmm. employed, all of these things are related. It's just understanding that um, in order to be for these things to be sustainable and safe, they have to be engineered a little differently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here, here. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I, I'm keeping you from from uh, happy hour. From cooking dinner for my family. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Cooking has gone oh. from this, you know, oh, I'm going to make this perfect, you know, perfect meal on a Saturday evening or a Sunday evening. Uh, you know, it's funny. The universe is funny, isn't it, Elise? I, I said, um, you know, we, we were doing some work on our apartment. And I said, once I, I, we get the work done, um, I want my kids to be there for every Sunday dinner. That's what I want to do, a Sunday dinner. And of course, the universe sort of laughed at me and said, Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. (laughs) You'll be Sally cooking all those dinners for them, all of them, not just Sunday, go for all of them. (laughs) Oh, man. Well, thank you. Thank you. Stay healthy, okay? You too. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Sally Krawcheck. For more, go to Elvest, E-L-L-E-V-E-S-T dot com. We also have stories with her as well as additional podcasts on goop.com. Please, if you haven't already, rate, review, and subscribe to the Goop podcast. And if you feel so inclined, please share it with a friend.